Each of these test tubes contains nitrogen dioxide gas, which I produced in the fume hood using the reaction of copper and concentrated nitric acid in a reaction similar to the reaction of copper video that I posted a while ago. I'm gonna put one of these in hot water and one of these in cold water and let's see what happens. Each of these test tubes contains cobalt chloride dihydrate, which I dissolved into some water. And then I also added a little bit of hydrochloric acid to give a bunch of extra chloride ions. And I'm gonna put these in hot and cold water as well. Both of these experienced a change when they were going from cold to hot and hot to cold again. And, and I can shift them back the, the other way by just changing them back to the hot and cold. And the cobalt chloride solution went more purplish, almost a blue color in the hot water, and then went back to being a pink color in the cold water. And again, if I were to change them back and forth, I would see them change in exactly the same way uh, in the hot and cold water. So what is going on in those test tubes over there? And why are they changing colors? Well, it turns out we're seeing evidence of something called Le Chatelier's principle, which if you're studying chemical equilibrium, you're gonna run into it early and you're gonna run into it often. And it's named after Henry Louis Le Chatelier, who was a French scientist in the late 1800s, early 1900s. Probably his name is Henri or something like that. Um, but there's a picture of him <clears throat> and he did a lot of work with uh, metals and alloys and other chemical principles, but he also did a lot with equilibrium and he's most known for the Chatelier's principle. So in this video, I want to walk you through the Chatelier's principle and the types of problems and questions that you're going to be seeing about the Chatelier's principle. So there's a lot of little variables here. Um, so, and I'll also include a couple of uh, public service announcements about questions you're likely to see, but that you should not be tricked by because people are going to try to trick you using Le Chatelier's principle, and I want to warn you about that. Okay, so let's get into it. What is Le Chatelier's principle? It is basically this statement, and everything else we do today comes from this statement. It says, if a change is imposed on a system that's at equilibrium, the system will shift in a direction that minimizes the change. Since equilibria are able to shift to the left and the right to uh, reactants and products, um, it can actually shift to alleviate any stress that you put on the system. And there's a number of different stresses that you can put on the system, and I'm going to walk you through each one. Uh, and then we'll do a couple of sample problems at the end so you can kind of see how things uh, go. All right. First, the changes on the system that uh, we're going to cover today are changing the concentration of a reactant or product, changing the pressure of the system, changing the temperature of the system, which is what I was doing over there. We'll get to those at the end and adding a catalyst to the system to see what happens with those. Okay, so let's start with changing the concentration of a reactant or product. So it turns out when you do have a system that's at equilibrium, um, what's going to happen? I'm just going to write a very general one. A plus B makes C plus, oh, just for fun, two Ds. Okay, so you can affect the equilibrium by dumping in more of any of the things that, that are at equilibrium, or you can affect it by maybe somehow selectively extracting something from that. And the equilibrium is going to want to undo what you did to it and get back to a balance. Because remember, the ratio of the products over the reactants uh, needs to be a constant. So for example, if I add a reactant, okay, and let's put our equilibrium constant expression Totally generic, but the concept applies here. If I add, for example, A, one of the reactants, then this concentration immediately gets bigger and the ratio of the products over the reactants gets smaller than it should be. So the reaction system says, oh, wait, we're, we're at a lower amount. Our Q value is too low. So let's shift to the right away from that to increase the products and decrease the reactants until we get back to our happy nirvana of the equilibrium constant ratio. Okay, same if you add a product. If you add a product like C or D, now your reaction quotient is going to be too big and it's going to shift to the left to try to alleviate that and get back down to the K value that it wants to be at. 
Okay, and what if you removed a reactant? You remove one of those, suddenly the bottom, the denominator gets smaller and suddenly your Q value is too high and so it's gonna shift left to lower the Q value and get it back to equilibrium. And if you remove a product, it'll shift to the right in a similar manner. Okay, so keep that in mind. That's probably the one you're gonna see the most often. What happens to an equilibrium system if we change the pressure? So if we change the pressure, then what's gonna happen is you'll get a situation where um, the system is going to wanna to respond to alleviate or replace the pressure that you put on it, okay? And so I'm gonna write this in a couple of different ways. So let's say you have a reaction where you have A and B making C and you get that going and let's say, okay, let's look at the thing. If pressure is increased, reaction will shift to the side with fewer moles of molecules. And if pressure is decreased, the reaction will shift to the side with more molecules. So let's say I have this system up here and I smush the container, make the pressure go higher. The system at equilibrium will be like, wow, the pressure is going up in here. Let's fix that. And so it'll actually shift to the right to take two molecules and make one molecule. So there's less molecules over there. But then if I expand the container again, the equilibrium system says, oh, wow, we got a lot more room here. Let's go back this way and make more molecules to fill that room. So that's one way. Now, I would have to say here that I have a, an equilibrium that we've already looked at several times. H2 plus I2 makes 2HI. All of these are in the gas phase. But if you would agree with me, maybe that two molecules on the left make two molecules on the right, there's no difference in the number of molecules. And if I smush and increase the pressure on this one or decrease the pressure on this one, it's not going to shift either way because there's no benefit to going one way or the other. It's two molecules on both sides. And so watch out for that in your chemistry travels. All right. There's a couple of ways you can change the pressure. And one is to add or subtract a reactant or product. And that goes back to C number one where we were changing the concentrations. Pressure is proportional to the concentration, so if you add more pressure or more molecules, it might try to shift in one way or the other. You can change the volume of the container. If the container gets larger, it'll shift to the side where there's more molecules. If the container is smaller, it'll shift to the side with fewer molecules. So again, you gotta cramp them up in there and they, they have less space to work with, so they just make more molecules if it's possible. And my first public service announcement is about this one. Okay. If you're doing textbook problems or you're taking AP Chem or something like that, chances are the writers of the questions will try to trick you with this. They'll make it sound really fancy and like important, like you should do something about this. They'll say, what if the pressure is changed by adding an inert gas like helium or argon or something like that? And the answer to this is, um, I'm trying to warn you not to be tricked because nothing will happen. They'll make you think like something should happen, but nothing will happen. There's no change to the system because yes, you're adding another gas, but it's not reacting with anything. And what's most important is the partial pressures of the gases in your equilibrium system are still in the same ratio with each other. And yes, the total pressure went up, but their partial pressures are still in the same ratio. So nothing is gonna happen to the equilibrium system. So we'll be watching out for that thing. And if you ever see it, you can just say, nope, you're not going to trick me. And I'm going to go on and say there's no change to the system. Okay, so let's talk about changing temperature for a moment. So when the temperature is changed, K will change, depending on whether the reaction is exothermic or endothermic. Okay, so let's do another just A plus B makes C. And let's say it's exothermic. So heat will be given off in an exothermic reaction. So if I were to add heat to the system, system like this, this you, it's helpful to think of heat as either a reactant or product. For an exothermic reaction, a heat is a product. And for an endothermic reaction, heat is a reactant. So that might be something like this. Heat plus D makes E plus F. Again, totally generic. Okay, but heat is either a product or a reactant. If I add heat to this first one, the system is going to be like, okay, well, wow, it's getting hot in here. 
let's use up some of that heat. And it's going to use up some of that heat to shift back to the left. But if I cool it down, it's going to be like, oh, it's getting cold in here. Let's produce some more heat to warm ourselves back up. And so it's going to go back to the right. And the opposite occurs down here. If I add heat to an endothermic reaction, it shifts to the right and to use up some of that heat. And if I take away heat from an endothermic reaction, it will go back to the left. Okay. And we'll see an example of that with those in just a second. So what about adding a catalyst? So you're going to be asked the question, uh, what if you take this equilibrium system and add a catalyst? And it's going to sound really official. This is public service announcement number two coming up. And if you see a question about catalysts using Le Chatelier's principle, run away. No, 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 don't run away. But don't be fooled by it. It'll sound really official and you'll feel like you want to do something and it's going to shift to the right or make more products or something. But actually, there will be no change to the equilibrium system. Okay, the rate at which the system reaches equilibrium may change. So yeah, it can get there faster, but it's not going to actually change the equilibrium uh, because that's a different constant. And so no change. Don't be fooled by it. They'll try to trick you, but please uh, don't do that. Okay, let's go back and look at our test tubes for a moment. All right, let's do the brown gas first. And there's the reaction that occurs. And I have written it this way. You could write it either way, but I wrote it this way with the NO2 as the product and they're squared and then N2O4 because I know these equilibrium constants. <clears throat> okay, so when I put it in hot water, it turned browner. When I put it in cold water, it turned uh, lighter. And the brown gas is this one. And this one is colorless. So in the cold temperatures, I'm getting more of this. And in high temperatures, I'm getting more of this. So does that mean this reaction is endothermic or exothermic? Well, when I added heat to it, it went to the right. And so that means heat is a reactant and this reaction is endothermic. And when I took away heat, it tried to produce some more heat to use it up by making more of this and it went more toward colorless. It didn't get totally colorless. I'd have to get it pretty cold for that. Um, but I did see a little bit of a change, okay? And another way to think about it is that at a lower temperature, the equilibrium constant is lower. And as the temperature got higher, the equilibrium constant increased, meaning it shifted more to the right. Equilibrium constants are temperature dependent. And so this is an example of two values uh, for this reaction. Okay. And I can summarize that in a table that looks like this. This table is often very helpful for my students to have in their notes and copy down and try to get used to. We can summarize it like this because sometimes you'll ask, be asked this question. If temperature increases and K increases or something in that category, is the reaction endothermic or exothermic? So check this out. If the temperature increases and K increases, the reaction is endothermic. Also, if the temperature decreases and K decreases, it's endothermic. So if the temperature and the K values are going in the same direction, it's endothermic. If the temperature and the K values are going in opposite directions, increase, decrease, decrease, increase, the reaction is going to be exothermic. So if that's helpful for you to try to remember or have in your notes, go for it. Um, pause the video and get that down if you can. All right, a little bit notes about my <clears throat> cobalt equilibrium. Again, at higher temperatures, it went toward the right-hand side. At lower temperatures, it went toward the left-hand side. So again, heat is a reactant. This is endothermic as written um, because at higher temperatures, we went more to the right. Okay, let's do a couple quick sample questions. I'm not gonna do a pause the video moment on this one. I'm just gonna race through them. Um, but you may see questions something like this. All right, if when the following changes are made to the equilibrium system above, which direction will the equilibrium shift? All right, more SO3 is added. That's adding a reactant. So that means it'll shift to the right. If the temperature is decreased, okay, this is the trickiest one, I think. If the, the delta H value tells me it's endothermic, so heat is a reactant. So if the temperature is decreased, it's going to want to shift to the left to make more heat, to you, make it to replace the heat that I'm taking away. If the container is made larger, it'll shift to the side of more molecules, which is the right-hand side, 
two molecules are making three molecules. So if the container gets bigger out, they'll be like, okay, we got more room. Let's make more molecules. If the pressure is increased by adding helium gas, uh, remember this? Uh oh, I, I feel like I want to do something and it's going to shift to the right or left, but I got to pause and remember, I'm not going to get tricked by this. You can't trick me. No change to the system. Sulfur dioxide is removed. If I was able to remove this one somehow and just drop it out, the system, system will shift to the right to make more of it. And finally, if a platinum catalyst is added, oh wow, it's platinum, must be important, must do something really cool. But in fact, again, PSA, don't say anything. Nothing's gonna happen there and there's gonna be no change to the equilibrium system. It might get there faster, but it's not gonna change the system's position at equilibrium. Uh, I guess we could do a uh, pause the video a moment, take a moment and see if you can uh, answer these questions and then I'll run through the answers in just a second. Okay, if you pause the video and came up with some answers, great. If not, if you're just following along, that's awesome too. So what will happen to the system when more carbon monoxide is added? That's a product. So we'll put it in there and it's going to shift to the left to decrease that. More lanthanum oxide is added. That's this stuff. And um, just, you might have said it'll shift to the left, but try, I didn't try to trick you on this. It just, it's just going to show up. That's a solid. It's a heterogeneous equilibria. And so in the K expression, we're only going to have CO to the third and CO2 to the third. And those solids are not going to be in there. So actually, there's going to be no change to the system in part B. Krypton is added to the flask. Okay, another noble gas being added and the pressure is going to go up. Will anything happen? No. Don't be fooled. Nope. Just move right on. Some lanthanum oxalate is removed. That's this stuff. And again, if I remove it, okay, that's great. It might You might think it'll shift to the left, but again, it's a solid. So no change to that system. If this reaction is endothermic and heat is added, so heat is over here on the reactant side, then if I add heat to it, it's going to use up some of that heat and make more of the products. And finally, the container is made larger. So what will happen to the system? It will try to make more molecules to fill up that space. And so the reaction will shift uh, more toward, um, toward the product side. Um, actually, no. So actually, these are actually going to stay the same. They'll actually increase the number of molecules to get back to the same pressures that they were before but the position of the equilibrium is not going to change uh, because there's no solids in there or anything on the bottom to change the ratio. So there you go. There you have it. And some questions about Le Chatelier's principle. Hopefully they'll help you if you're doing those types of problems in your AP Chem course or your uh, other chem course. Uh, if you have any questions that you'd like me to answer or ask, uh, please feel free to leave them in the comments or send them to me. In the meantime, have a great day and happy solving.